you know that the um, if you had a pool of water and uh, a vortex appeared in the middle of it, uh, you might, if you didn't know the water was there, you might look at the vortex and say, oh, there's something there. And I think this is what happens when we look at our material world. What we're looking at is, um, is, the, is the flow of space-time and where it flows in a way like so, like uh, what I'm showing right now, uh, where the dynamic, where the Coriolis dynamics and the structure and the differential, the differential or the gradient, the density changes, like when you put the plug um, on the bathtub, uh, then the, the flow of the structure of space and the flow of the vacuum energy, as we saw, which is an enormous amount of energy, starts to uh, produce this double torus structure that we see at the galactic level, at the quasar level, at the star level, the, the plasma dynamic of our sun does this. Uh, we've written physics showing that the electron positron cloud looks like this, and so on. Then uh, we, as soon as this flow happens, then we experience it as the uh, material world, the, the physicality of the structure of space-time, not knowing that the vortex in the pool is actually is actually a function of the water in the pool, that the vortex is not isolated from the water. The vortex is a dynamic of the water itself. So if we understand that, then obviously it becomes clear that uh, through technological means, we can pull the plug on the top of the energy of the vacuum. We can, we can just like when we pull the plug um, in, in our tub, uh, then the, the water starts flowing, uh, you know, and if you have a little rubber ducky in your tub, uh, it will follow that vortex that's been created. And, and if you actually had a little teeny uh, generator with, with little propeller on the end, you could, you could actually pull power from the water going down the tub. Well, you know, um, the same idea is that you can create a device that creates a gradient in the structure of space-time, and you just need to produce a very tiny gradient, and it will start flowing. And as we saw earlier, uh, only 10 to minus 39 percent of the energy available produces all the atomic structure. So uh, even if we pull, you know, 10 to the minus 50 percent of what's there, it would be an enormous humongous amount of energy and uh, and literally one system could power a whole planet. Uh, never mind uh, that you'd probably create cur curvature in space-time, be able to control gravitational fields, and, you know, our society will change radically as a whole, as a result. And so, and, uh, and when I talk about that, I talk about it usually in the future tense, but I assure you that uh, this level of discovery is eminent and that it's, uh, it's, it's immersing, it's emerging everywhere and uh, there's, a, you know, and it's going to change our world dramatically. It's going to change the way we do things, the way we think of energy. I mean, if, if we're pulling energy directly out of the vacuum, well, there's vacuum energy everywhere in the universe. We can go anywhere we want and have a literally infinite amount of energy. As well, we'll be able to curve space-time, create gravitational field and all this. That comes with it because if you're producing a, a little vortex in the water of space-time, you're basically curving it. It's like the rubber ducky is falling into the vortex. And, you, and so you're producing a gravitational field. It's the rotational relationship to the current gravitational field that holds us to the planet is uh, appropriate, then you'll get lift instead of being attracted. And, uh, and, then, and then when you calculate these, uh, I, the acceleration is going to be enormous. And so uh, I was, I was, uh, I, I wanted to mention as well that I skipped to a large part of the presentation that I usually do, uh, that has to do with realizing that 
the structure of space time and spin are fundamentally uh, linked, and, and that the spin uh, function of space time is what produced the gravitational field. I call it uh, I, I call it space time torque. It's a fundamental torque that's at the source of the spin of all things. Unlike the standard model, which gives spin as a as a source, but uh, no given source for it, uh, meaning that they just say, oh well, it's it all everything started spinning at the Big Bang and has been spinning ever since in, since in an ideal uh, frictionless environment, which is obviously incorrect. We see lots of friction in our universe, and everything should have stopped spinning a long time ago if it was just the result of an impulse at the Big Bang uh, 13.7 billion years ago. So, uh, you know, my research in the papers uh, Elizabeth Rauscher and I have written, uh, Dr. Rauscher and I have written with the help of Dr. Heisen, is that uh, no, there is a fundamental force that's continuously spinning everything into existence, continuously applying a torque, uh, and it's because the structure of space time has this fundamental spin in it. Basically, uh, like the top example, the rubber ducky is spinning because the water is going down the drain. So there's a constant applied torque to the system. So obviously, if that's true, and there's evidence that it's true, for instance, there's experiments that are done by the European Space Agency and by the Russians, where they spin a magnetic ring at uh, 5,000 RPM, super, uh, super um, conductive ring, and uh, they, they notice that there's a relief of, of, uh, of gravity for objects around the ring, it's very, it's micrograms that are disappearing, but there's still um, a relief of gravity. And 5,000 RPM is very, very slow, considering what I'm, what I'm doing. Uh, and so um, here we see that spin and, and gravity, or spin and the curvature of space-time are related. And, um, you know, there, I could cite many other examples of that. But let's move forward. So the idea is that obviously if we understand this fundamental pattern and we build technology that reproduces it, basically if we get space-time to spin a little bit in a certain region, if we make our own vortex, then all of a sudden we have access to uh, gravitational field and the power of the vacuum. And so we, uh, I, we built a coil and that's where I was when we left off this morning. And uh, this coil, this was a first iteration. This is almost 10 years ago. And uh, I assure you that the, where we're going is, is uh, much more advanced than this. But um, this uh, was, uh, you know, the, this principle is the same. And here we have basically ribs uh, of material, a uh, conductive material. And uh, these angles are all very important. And here is the uh, a container, a, a space in between the two torses um, in the middle, uh, uh, ready for a container. And uh, the container has uh, various um, uh, gases in it. And so that uh, we can pulse each of the ribs in a sequence. Uh, to produce rotation in the gases in the middle of the container, which are enclosed in a, in a quartz crystal ball that was cut for me by the crystal industry. A very, actually, advanced, um, you know, uh, technology had to be developed to actually make the ball. But um, this then uh, uh, allows us to spin uh, highly dense magnetic field inside a plasma gas uh, at very, very high velocity in the, in the correct configuration to reproduce the same dynamics that we find in nature. For instance, the dynamics of a galaxy, the dynamics of the plasma dynamics of our sun, and so on. So basically, the way we can look at this is uh, assuming that all oh, this is correct, and I believe it is, all the math works, all the 
concepts work, all the philosophical understanding works, and it has deep meaning in many, many levels. Well, when we understand this, we uh, um, we can apply it, and this, um, you know, and so this leads to, uh, if you can think of it as, as making a big atom or a small sun in laboratory. And um, so the next, I'm sorry, I went back somehow. Uh, the next uh, thing that happened is we coiled those hemispheres. And so this was my early lab. Um, and, uh, and we, and, uh, we assembled the device um, to, uh, uh, to, with, with uh, the proper uh, alignments and geometry. And then, uh, well, and then many things started to happen. But uh, uh, what I wanted to share with you is that uh, this is not, it turns out, and, and this I, I, I'm just releasing to the public as well. Uh, I don't know if you're all aware of this amazing scientist, genius, that lived in the 30s um, and 20s. Um, his name was Walter Russell. And uh, it turns out that Walter Russell was a friend of Tesla. And um, they hung around together. And, uh, and if you're interested in Walter Russell, I suggest you read uh, Atomic Suicide. I think it's one of his best books, especially the, the forward by his wife. Wonderful. And uh, Tesla told Russell uh, to that um, the knowledge that he was bringing forward, and, and Russell brought some very important knowledge. For instance, he, he discovered some of the most important elements in the table of elements long before they were identified in laboratory, which eventually credited for them. Uh, but uh, he, uh, Tesla told Russell that he should hide his material because Tesla was really getting a run for his money at the time, and, uh, and put it in a safe not to be released for a thousand years because humanity wasn't ready. Well, you know, um, it, uh, I, I had built this uh, device in laboratory, and at the same time, uh, I had been asked to be on the uh, scientific advisory board for the foundation that Walter Russell's uh, legacy left behind, which was the, uh, which is the University of Science and Philosophy. And uh, the director uh, of the, the, the institution over there um, actually released to us, uh, not knowing what I had built, uh, but thinking that the, this you know, was time to release and this information. This is almost 10 years ago. Uh, I'm just, you know, in the last few months for the first time, showing these documents publicly. So these are actually original documents. You can see they're signed by me in 1927. And uh, it was a device very similar to mine. And um, you can see here, and uh, it, the vortices are reversed. Inside there, this was made out of iron. And inside there, uh, or steel, in, inside there he had water. And uh, he would put trace elements. And very interestingly, this, um, you know, here's some more of the blueprints. And uh, very interestingly, these documents came to me with tests uh, that were performed by Westinghouse at the time, which, you know, was pretty well, uh, uh, well, in some cases, a military installation. And um, the tests were done independently by Westinghouse. And uh, the test showed that uh, trace elements in the water inside the device uh, would, uh, would be altered when the device would change, somewhat like a transmutation of elements. And um, so this, we can see here, uh, he had quartz in there as well. And, um, you know, it's remarkable, a uh, very, very similar device, uh, you know, that I think, you know, anybody that knows Walter Russell and knows of the breadth of his work, the man was no doubt very 
much ahead of his time, great genius and, and a, a, a very uh, advanced being. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, he came very close to understanding very similar systems. Um, here, for instance, this statement is remarkable from the Westinghouse testing, where they called the device uh, the transmutator. Uh, so because uh, because they found transmutation changes in the water. This is 1927. So you can imagine quite a quite a uh, uh, a long time ago, and, and uh, you know the advancement that it could have happened if this would have been released to the public. But I, I guess we just weren't ready. Now, uh, if we, uh, let's see, I'm trying to turn the slide. And it's uh, locking up a little bit, so uh, please bear with me. But if we, um, okay, so here is, you see, when I was uh, playing with uh, my uh, structure, my device, and uh, you know, many things happen. I, I want to, you know, I don't, I don't have time to go through all the, the things that are, that happened then, but um, certainly, like dramatic effects uh, were were experienced uh, from the the device, and so, and it was unclear to me um, if some of the effects were healthy or unhealthy, and uh, I wanted to know. And uh, it was hard to tell. It was hard to measure. Uh, it was, uh, you know, some of the effects. Uh, first of all, the device was unplugged. Um, after the initial spin uh, of the device, it continuously produced this uh, spin effect in the structure of space time for almost a year and a half. Um, and then the initial spin was very slow. It was just the first test. I was just testing my electronics. We spun it up, maybe up to 5,000 RPM, not much more than that, so it was very, very slow compared to where I'm going next. And um, this, um, you know, and but, but after we turned it off is when the effects actually start to occur a few uh, days after. And, um, there was a lot of um, changes um, that were occurring in material materials around the device while the effects were occurring. And so I decided to put water around there because water is an easy compound to, um, to analyze and uh, any changes, uh, you know, a small, um, if, you know, you can get, it, it's pretty malleable so it can change pretty easily and so on. So I put water in there and um, so on the left, <coughs> of uh, the slide, uh, looking at it, um, your, is the, the sample that is the tap water. So that was my tap water, which was well water. It was good water to start with. And um, on the uh, right, uh, then, is the charge water. And I called it charge water just because it seemed like it was charging up as we put it beside the device. And in this case, we put it beside the device for 20 minutes, and then send the two samples to laboratory. And uh, so the labs came, the lab test came back with uh, this result. So this is this is tap water. This is 20 minutes in the field, and here we have uh, a, a large change in pH levels, uh, going from 7.7 .7 to 8.3. Uh, there's changes in conductivity. Uh, obviously, uh, there's changes in um, uh, biocarbonates, um, you know, the soluble salts change. Uh, so there's many changes in the water that occurred just from, from placing the water beside this uh, object uh, with no power going to it uh, for 20 minutes. And uh, so those changes were important because it showed that there was physical effects that were occurring. Uh, these physical effects included, for instance, um, the disappearance of uh, fractures or microfractures and crystals. 
if they were placed around the device and so on. Then, um, you know, I wanted to see if the water was more uh, supportive of life uh, when it was charged or less, you know, was it good for life or was it bad for life? Um, so I got an independent test done with flowers where they took uh, flowers that came from the same plant that bloomed on the same day and stuck them in various water. This is my tap water on the back. This is the uh, resonated uh, uh, water. I'm sorry. Uh, and um, uh, then this is um, the water of the uh, place where the where the test was being done. And the uh, fourth one, uh, so and it's filtered and softened. Um, and the fourth one is just filtered, and it's a reverse os os osmosis filter. And uh, then, so the flowers were put in October 27, 2000. Um, in uh, November 6, 2000, uh, the flowers were doing okay. My tap water is starting to go a little bit and the filtered reverse osmosis water is starting to go. So then um, we, uh, you know, the flowers uh, continue to deteriorate slowly. Uh, November 16th, um, the filtered reverse osmosis water uh, is definitely going. Uh, the plant is uh, losing it rapidly. Um, the tap water that only has been softened, um, it, the flower is doing better. Um, the, my tap water, that flower is starting to go, we can see, and the resonated one is looking good. Here, um, this is uh, November 19th. Um, the, um, the filtered water with a softened softener uh, is completely gone. Uh, the tap water is remarkably doing better than the reverse osmosis water. Um, this is my tap water, and, um, and and then the resonated water. And this is November 23rd, and you can see now it's a dramatic difference. Um, you know these flowers are completely gone. This is the control, my tap water. And this is the resonated water, and uh, you can see the difference is remarkable. Um, the resonated water, almost a month after, uh, has been uh, is looking almost as good as the day we picked it, um, or the day they picked it. And uh, here, um, you can see that uh, this is completely degraded, and um, it's completely gone. A very large difference, and the, this difference is only the result of a few uh, minutes, uh, some 20 minutes, of the water being in the proximity of the device. There was no filtration, there was no alteration of the water in any way. Um, it was a completely passive test where the water was just sitting a few inches away from the from the technology with the technology not having any power going to it, just uh, doing its thing in the field, in the structure of space-time. So I think, uh, you know, these are actually, you know, some of the slightest effect. Uh, you know, there was not much more dramatic effects and so on. So I, I think we're really moving towards a whole new physics, a whole new understanding of the structure of space-time, the flow, uh, dynamics that produce the material world, and we're hopefully going to start to understand it better and harmonize with it, uh, and realize that there is infinite amount of energy everywhere we are. The universe didn't plop us here with a limited amount of resources, uh, expecting us to have to fight for them. Uh, I, I think that we've been given everything we need, that the infinite amount of energy, this infinite amount of space, uh, and we're just, um, where our society is at this point, where it's just stepping into uh, this new understanding, this new paradigm that uh, reversed the concepts of scarcity 
and bring us into concept of abundance. So there's, uh, there's so much to explore, and it's just a question of us understanding the fundamental principles of creation, really understanding what gravity is, how the structure of space-time functions, the, the energy available in the vacuum, and our society is just going to blossom. Uh, into something that we can barely imagine today. And I'm not talking about this in a future tense, as in, you know, generations from now. I'm talking about this in the next few years. I'm privy to already many different technologies that are remarkable. I think you guys have been presented some of these ideas uh, during the last two days. Uh, I think it's very exciting, and, um, and, uh, and, and I'm glad to be part of it. So I think we wanted to do question and answers uh, during this session. So I'd be glad to take some questions if that's possible. Absolutely, I think it's very interesting, and that's why I earlier mentioned that the Planck's distance is a very, very close approximation to the to the phi ratio. And I don't think that's a, you know, um, that that that's by chance at all. Um, and and so actually, uh, but but it, what I would say in your languaging is that. Uh, I, you know, when you say that it's the phi or the the phi function that holds the hydrogen together, I would say that the phi function is the result of the natural flow of the structure of space-time. That's why everything organizes under these ratios. Uh, if you look at the galactic arm, for instance, you get a very, very close approximation to the phi ratio or the Fibonacci series. Um, I think that, you know, Flowing structures like the flow of air, the flow of water, the flow, you know, all fluid dynamic structures will obey the phi relationship uh, because that's the path of least, least resistance for the flow to occur. And so the result is that you're going to find those mathematics everywhere in nature because that's actually how it's produced. And so it's very, very important to understand that because if we understand that when we engineer these devices, when we are trying to interact with the structure of space-time, then we're going we're gonna to respect the phi ratio in our engineering. We're going to make that part of the engineering so that the structure of space-time is able to flow through the system. Otherwise, it will not, or it would be very impeded, or it will be intermittent, or it's just not going to work. So, it, so phi is fundamental, and it's in nature and everywhere. And I believe that it's because nature emerges from the vacuum structure, and the vacuum structure is inherently a phi flow. Yes, and then um, so we take that language to suggest that golden ratio optimized fractality, in a way, could be said to be the cause of gravity and the centripetal force. Do you think that language is too extreme, or what do you think? Well, yeah, I, I, I would definitely, you know, um, you, you'd probably, you know, physicists would definitely take offense to that type of language, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I would reverse the sentence myself, um, you know, I really, you know, the phi ratio, 
ratio is, I believe, is the result of the flow. You see, it, it, what's important is that the, that the space time is flowing, and when it flows, it produces a phi ratio. So it, it's like, uh, to say that gravity is the result of a phi ratio doesn't tell us anything about gravity, but to say that gravity is the result of a flow, uh, you know, a curvature. Einstein said that gravity is the result result of curvature in space-time. Like if you put a ball on a trampoline surface, it will bend, and any ball around it will get attracted because it's rolling towards that first one. Well, you know, if you realize that the surface of the trampoline is not um, smooth, but it, it's curling, just like water going down the drain, that's why it bends. That's why it curves, is because spin is involved. When you re realize that, now you have the source uh, of the, the curvature of space-time. Now you understand how it occurs, and you know you can reproduce it. And when you do, you will have to obey the phi relationship because that's how fluids flow. Yes, sir. And the, we had suggested that um, in hydrodynamics, uh, Golden ratio is modeled as perfect curvature. So in a fact, right. it, so for what they call optimized translation for vorticity. So. When we additionally showed that the ratio makes the most constructive possible wave interference, so the experience of Golden mean that it looks like a matrix, then that would seem to say that Golden mean ratio perfects compression. Do you agree? Uh, well, yeah, that it compress, that it, it's like uh, the optimal way for nature to uh, collapse towards singularity, that yeah. nature could collapses towards singularity, and the result of this collapse, because of the gradient, like people say, well, if everything is a singularity, why is everything collapsing towards singularity? Well, that's because there's infinite amount of gradients of density, you know, just like a weather pattern on Earth, you know, a small change in the gradient in density, I and mean, we're talking extremely small, a few degrees different in temperature, and boom, you've got a hurricane with like millions of uh, tons of, of material, mostly water, flying around, uh, you know, huge electromagnetic discharges and all this stuff is all happening because of a small gradient change. So imagine the change in gradient between the structure of the vacuum between galaxies and the inside of a galaxy and the surface of a sun and the inside of an atom and all this. You know, the gradients are huge, so, so space-time is constantly flowing in and out of, the of its own structure, like little vortices are, are, are what we call atoms. Yes, wasn't it often said that um, Einstein concluded that the perfect collapse of charge was the solution to gravity, and if golden ratio is perfect collapse, it's pretty close to saying golden ratio causes gravity, isn't it? Um, well, you know, in my view, it would be the other way around. Is that uh, I would well, actually, I would say that spin, um, you know, gradient and spin as a result of gradient produces uh, the spi the phi spiral, which we see everywhere in nature. I mean, it's a chicken and an egg problem. 